Welcome to the Wall Street Lab podcast, where we interview top financial professionals and deconstruct their practices to give you an insider look into the world of finance. Here are your hosts, Lucas Muzialski and Leo Severino. Hello and welcome to the episode 18 of the Wall Street Lab podcast. Today, we are diving back into the world of private equity. It's been a while since we had a private equity episode, and this time we're actually going to be operating on the border of academia as well as the practical approach to private equity. So I find this a really interesting episode. Yeah, we had the pleasure to talk to Professor Oliver Gottschalk. I guess it's fair to say that he's one of the leading experts in private equity research and the academic world. He's a professor at HEC Paris or HEC Paris, and he's also, among other things, the co-founder and head of research at Pirx, which is an advisory firm that provides a private equity fund due diligence and benchmarking services. And for us, it was extremely interesting to get uh, Oliver's perspective as both Luke and I worked in private equity fund investing before, so all the topics that we discussed were extremely relevant to us at the time. Oliver was kind enough to spend some of his precious time talking about some of the latest research in this area. Yeah, even for me as a private equity outsider, I found this to be very relevant and very interesting, especially because, yeah, let's be honest, it's always been a very mysterious topic. And for that, it's it's really good to see how fund performance is measured, where they get the data from and how biased that data might be, how to deal with that. And there's whole research topics on how to benchmark private equity fund performance. And of course, last but not least, Oliver was talking also about how to get into private equity. So I really hope you enjoyed this episode. Just on a little side note, Oliver was recording from an airport lounge. So don't be distracted by a little background noise from time to time. Yeah, really awesome episode. So stick around and I hope you guys enjoy it as much as we did. If you like the episode, please leave us a five-star review on iTunes. It really helps us to grow the show and reach people like yourselves who would enjoy listening to this kind of content. And now, without further ado, please enjoy our interview with Professor Oliver Gottschalk. Hey, good to hear you. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm very well. I'm very well. All right, Oliver, thank you very much for agreeing to be part of Wall Street Lab today. I'm glad to have you on because I have so many questions about private equity. You know, it's a topic that has been in the financial news for, you know, lately, especially given the amount of interest that we've seen in the asset class lately. But before we do that, I know that you, among other things, you are a professor at Hachisei Paris. Why don't you give us uh, an idea of what are some of the projects that you're working on today, some of the things that you're involved with. Certainly, certainly. My pleasure. Um, so I've been, uh, been researching private equity now for, for the better half of the last 20 years, and uh, I, I always look at the asset class very much from an empirical standpoint. I think it's an important asset class, as you said, it's an asset class that gets lots of attention. But the debate is sometimes characterized by what I would call an unhealthy ratio of opinion over facts. Many people see private equity with a bit of an ideological angle, and in fact, we, we don't know so many things about this asset class from a from a scientific standpoint. So it's a thankful asset class for, for an academic if you turn this situation around, because based on the empirical work I'm doing, I, I try to you know, contribute a couple of more facts to that debate. Uh, research themes uh, include the you know, general performance of private equity, ways to measure and, and, and capture risk in this asset class, which is a very particular challenge uh, for uh, reasons um, we can go into later if you want. And, and then more importantly also how actors in the asset class can identify good investment opportunities. So um, how you recognize a good private equity fund manager when they stay in front of you, what are good guiding principles to build a private equity portfolio. So there's a whole, whole range of research uh, projects going on, but all centered around the desire to better understand risk and return of the asset class in general. Let's start with with data, you touched a very important point. I mean, if you are in the private equity industry, you will very clearly notice that there are different data providers that provide different 
performance measurements with their own flaws. So as a limited partner, for example, how do you navigate through that sea of data that sometimes is not reliable? How do you go about doing that? Well, it's a, it's a tough one. And uh, let me first of all say that I mean, I have full um, appreciation and respect for all those who are in the business of trying to gather data on private equity, make the data that's out there better, because that's not necessarily a very, a very thankful task. There's no general disclosure requirement to private equity funds. So you only see data if you somehow find your ways to get to data. And the different data vendors have, have found different paths. Some kind of survey the industry, other kind of gather and assemble data from those who are kind of forced to disclose information, like the pension schemes, for example, are forced mm-hmm. to disclose certain types of information on their asset class. Um, others leverage, you know, investments they see in portfolios of sister organizations. But to be very clear, nobody has the perfect database in private equity. Nobody sees everything and nobody sees information on all the deals out there. And I know this and sometimes made me smile if I, with my own data, which I've gathered over the last 15 years from different limited partners, if I try to publish based on this data, a standard response that you get from the academic journals is, well, you got the study, I understand your sample, how representative is your sample? And then I always write back to the journal editor and say, well, if you tell me how big the universe is, um, I tell you how big my sample is. <laughs> and then they usually refer to one of the standard data vendors to say, well, the universe is defined by company XYZ. And then I said, well, if I look at my data, in some years I have an 80% coverage, and some years I have 120% coverage because the data vendor doesn't see everything, and I, I happen to see a little more in that particular year in that particular segment of the market. Mm-hmm. So as nobody knows the universe, all we know is that these databases are all imperfect, and, and we always have to be very careful in interpreting that data points. I, I always encourage people to say, well, try to do your best effort to get as much data as you can. Pay importantly attention to what possible biases you have to suspect of a certain data vendor and then draw your conclusions. So on the bias, for instance, if somebody basically gathers a database on uh, information that comes from somebody's portfolio, well, you hope that they haven't chosen randomly some funds. They've probably chosen these funds into their portfolio because they wanted to maximize performance. So that may be a, a good sample, but that's probably not an unbiased sample on performance. Mm-hmm. And you may think about ways to adjust for those biases. So mm-hmm. it's, it's a difficult exercise. And sure. frankly, I, it, it would be, it would be a good development for the industry if, if the industry could somehow converge against at least some form of clearinghouse or data vendor who has you know, a consistent clean database. We don't need to disclose information on individual players in private equity because some of the information may be considered a competitive advantage of those players. But at least general reference points, abstract statistics would just be helpful for folks to navigate that the cloud. Absolutely. Now, do you, as a, let's say you have, you have a pension scheme that decided to start investing in private equity. Would you recommend them to start gathering their own data along with using third party data vendors? Certainly, yes, but that'll take a very, very long time. And it's a, it's an extremely complex and resource intensive exercise. I've, I've been part of exercises 15 years ago with some of the biggest pension schemes in the world who had been in private equity for a decade tried to gather data on this and they frankly throw hundreds of thousands of dollars at this, and they and they failed because they couldn't get it to work. There are now professional service providers who help pension schemes, for instance, to get a better view on their data and gather data on their behalf for the fund managers. But you really want to be, you know, you want to have a thoughtful approach on how to manage that data. Always keeping in mind that this makes sense if you're the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority and you have, you know, tens and tens of billions of dollars in that asset class alone, if you are a smaller, smaller investment plan, you probably have to rely more on service providers, both for your data and for investment support and diligence, because it doesn't, doesn't make sense given your limited scale to make these investments yourself. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Now, uh, another, another, I guess, anomaly, if you will, of the private equity industry is that the fees are based on uh, capital committed rather than if you look at hedge funds or, or traditional uh, mutual fund managers, usually those management fees are calculated based on, on net asset value. And I guess this is a topic that has been on, of debate for a while, but do you think that it will ever change or do you think this is we're stuck with management fee based on committed capital for a long time to come? <laughs> well, it, it, it started to change a little bit, I mean, but it's moving at, at, at a glacial pace. Um, I think the first step was to recognize uh, rather than pay and 
the, um, the, the, the management fee for the entire 10 years of the fund on the commercial capital that's paid for the first five years, the so-called investment period on the size of the fund and then on the remaining net asset values. Absolutely. That's, I think, uh, the terms that are more and more uh, common these sorts of things, let alone as a good development. Uh, you know, you have to, have to ask yourself, why do you pay on the size of the fund? And the starting point is just if, if I was launching my private equity firm today, I had no other income. I need something to be operational in the first year of my existence until I find the first year investments. So if I ever only get fees on the capital invested, you know, I, 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 I never get going. Um, yep. So I think in a stylized ideal world, you would say the management fee should somehow be just based on budget against the actual projected cost of the operation. Mm-hmm. And ideally, you would want everything that goes beyond this to be performance-based. We're very far away from this ideal world. And uh, I think the industry with the LP Association, the ILPA and others, is making good moves towards a better state of the world. But it's very, very difficult to, to change things because I found these terms of conditions to be very, very standardized. There's nothing like a pricing mechanism. Like you would expect right. the better investors to be able to charge a little more and the average investors only to charge average. Um, that is happening in private equity because the term structure is so much of a signaling effect. And if mm-hmm. you cannot observe quality ex ante necessarily, uh, nobody's going to stand up and say, well, I'll charge a little less because then they basically signal a poor quality mm-hmm. and that'll, that'll harm them more than it may attract more demand for their funds. So we're, we're, we're stuck in that equilibrium right now and it's going to take lots of time and effort to, to slowly move away from that. Yeah, and, and I guess that's, you know, that's a problem for, you know, if you have a pension fund starting out their PE program, they have the onus of cash management when they're investing in private equity because if they put in, uh, let's say, $50 million into, into fund A and they take, you know, three, four years to call the capital, you, you have basically a lot of money sitting on the sidelines for a while. So I guess for LPs, ideally, the onus of cash management would fall on, on, onto the GP, but I don't think that's, that's going to come at any time soon. Yeah, and I don't necessarily agree because, I mean, the other, the other perspective is to say, well, the GP is supposed to be really good at making buyouts or, or private equity investment. Let them focus on that and don't distract them with the need to manage cash. Mm-hmm. Depending on what LP you are, you may have good ways to do something with your cash. In the meantime, you, you, you know your liquidity constraints better. You may be a family office or, or a pension plan or endowment. Um, these are very, very different requirements on liquidity and cash management. So I think initially to say, let the GP focus on what they're good at and let them call the capital only when they need it, right. that's not a bad starting point. Um, of course, where you have to be careful then is as an LP getting into private equity, you want to be very careful to be aware of those kind of inconveniences with respect to cash management and have mm-hmm. some approach to manage this based on learnings. Right. Yeah, and that's a, an interesting point that you touched on. And one question that I had regarding that is that GPs are becoming ever smarter uh, with their cash management and, and, and ways to improve their performance. And based on the current low interest rate environment, a lot of them started using bridging facilities in order to better be able to manage their, their capital calls. What is your view on bridging facilities in general? Well, it, it has often life. It depends on the on the calibration and the dosage. I mean, the starting point to put a little bit of bridging in place is, as related to earlier conversation topic, it's just the smoothing of the cash flows, right? It's every time you call capital or distribute capital, it's it's an administrative burden. And you know, if you call capital on a on a you know twice a month, a little bit for a management fee, a little bit for a small add-on investment, that just creates lots of administrative headache between LP and GP. So a little bit of bridging just to say, well, let me collect all these expenses and then once a quarter or once every six to eight weeks, I make one capital call for the aggregate. I think that's a very healthy use of the bridging, which really only solves a optimizes an an admin challenge. Mm -hmm. I think if you go beyond this and then say, all right, let's use the bridges actually to, you know, delay capital calls, you get into a territory that is much more complicated. Because if you imagine if the same GP um, he says, well, I'll make an investment now. I have this uh, convenient bridge facility that I can bridge this out for a year. So I only call the capital in one year's time. Well, there's a bunch of things happening. The first is that he pays interest rate on that bridging facility while the, the, the corresponding cash is still sitting with the limited partner. 
Now, some of these limited partners may be happy to have the capital call delayed um, because they have other good uses of their money, mm -hmm. and it's fine. Uh, you can also imagine limited partners who are paying negative interest rates on their cash deposits. Mm -hmm. Those will be furious because on the one side, they pay negative interest rates. On the other side, they indirectly pay the 80% um, of the interest on the bridge facility. That's clearly for them a very suboptimal situation. Absolutely. The, the next layer, the next layer comes in then, if, but this is becoming a bit technical, on what these bridges do to the incentive scheme of the fund. Mm -hmm. The bridge by design is shortening the duration of the investment, so all out equal, it'll increase IRR relative to the multiple. If many fund terms are running on, on internal rate of return on IRR, it's going to make it easier for the fund manager to pass the hurdle rate and, and get into carry. So they can benefit financially from that. And that's something that the limited partners, of course, look at something very ambivalent. On the one hand side, some of themselves may be rewarded on the IRR, so they like that. Uh, others see, well, I pay more fees for the same multiple return, so that's something I like much less. Absolutely. The last dimension I'd like to mention about the bridging is one that is very close to my heart as somebody who worries about data reliability, benchmarks, ability to identify top performers in the asset class, and that's the mechanical impact of those bridging facilities on performance. Mm -hmm. I've done a large study for, for an LP client of mine earlier this year in which I analyzed a few hundred of historic funds based on the cash flows. Mm -hmm. These were from a time where no uh, bridging was commonly used, and then I simulated bridging facilities, always with the assumption that one fund uses the bridging facility, the others don't. And I looked at what happened to performance, and on the average, performance went up a few hundred basis points, as you would expect it. Mm -hmm. But in some cases, uh, but, but in a non-trivial amount of cases, 10% or so, the performance was distorted in a, in a really meaningful fashion. You had cases where returns were from 15% to 25%. They went from 18% to 60%. Oh. All else equal, only with the introduction of the bridging. And if you want to understand why this can be the case, you're going to look at how exactly IRR works right. and, and recognize that the IRR formula is very sensitive to what happens very early on in the life of a fund. Mm -hmm. If you imagine the fund makes a, a, good, a good first investment, you know, they double the money within two years, that's an IRR of 40-some percent. If they bridged out that first capital call by a year, they would have doubled the money in one year. Well, that's mathematical and IRR of 100%. As IRR for the entire life of the fund is very sensitive to what's happened early on in the life of the fund, and if you imagine what I just ha described to happen at the beginning of that fund, you can see how the performance for the entire fund may be upward biased systematically without any change in the fundamentals, but only due to the use of the bridge facility. This pollutes the performance statistics because if I take whatever a 2010 vintage today, I know for a fact that some of the underlying funds are bridging, others don't. What I don't know is who's bridging how much. And I also don't observe as an outsider whether the cash flow pattern of these funds is in any way sensitive to what the bridge could do early on in the life of that fund. So I have a black box, and it may well be that a good number of funds who show up as top quartile IRR are only there because they use bridging ag aggressively and they got lucky on an early quick distribution. And this makes some limited partners now question the validity of some of these performance statistics. And they turn to folks like myself to see what math can we introduce to protect ourselves from that. Uh, and that triggers some of the data vendors to, to look at this exact same math and work with me to see, well, how can we integrate performance measures that are not subject to this bias from the bridging so we can kind of clean, protect, and sanitize our performance statistics. So who is in the top quartile or really deserves to be in the top quartile, and it's not just lucky based on this bridging phenomenon I described. Right, right. Do you, do you think there is any way that LPs, before doing any type of due diligence in funds, do you think that can rule out the possibility of a fund overusing the bridging facility or using the bridging facility as a way to purely artificially increase performance rather than help the cash management process of the, of the fund? I mean, there, there are a couple of things you can look at, even though it's difficult to, to, to see this from the outside without very, very deep data. One of the things you can look at is just to look at the terms of the bridging, you know, for, for how long can they bridge, for what maximum amount they can bridge. Mm 
they kind of protect you against it because if some funds can or they can borrow whatever 10% of the funds only for 90 days, you can probably conclude that it's unlikely that you'll have lots of this distortion going on. If, as is the case more recently, they can borrow up to whatever 50% of the funds for up to 180 days, then it's a different story. Mm-hmm. Then at least you can just say that you have to be suspicious. And then if you really want to get in the bottom of it, well, you got to ask the fund for basically the levered and the unlevered fund level cash flows. Mm-hmm. And then it can actually quantify to what extent performance was distorted. But they're easily, just to give you a feeling for the masses here, we're living in a world where the net performance after bridging on a fund is quite commonly higher than the gross returns you have at the deal level. So the higher our boost through the bridging compensates the feed rack on performance. Mm-hmm. And if you just look at how the economics of this work, you, you have to ask yourself, well, this cannot be the case because, I mean, fees are actually cash that are being paid here. That's an actual, you know, an, an actual loss of performance. Mm-hmm. Well, the bridging just moves cash flows around. So that's, that's a bit, uh, a bit surprising, but it happens more often than you would think. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now let's touch on a very important topic in, in private equity, which is performance persistence. And I know that you've, you've spent a lot of time on this and a lot of your, your peers have also spent some time understanding that phenomenon. You know, I, I'm not sure if I'm right here, but I don't think there is a consensus on whether or not there is a consistency in performance in private equity funds. Can you give us sort of the most up-to-date consensus on, on that topic? Yeah, I actually think there, there is consensus, but you have to pay attention to the, to the details. So, I mean, historically, we, we, we all know that there's, there's very, very little to low performance consistency in most asset classes. So, so the original finding in private equity, first in the Kaplan and Shaw paper, uh, and then uh, then repeated in, in my own work with Ludovic Fali, who showed that at the fund level, looking at IRR, there is performance persistence from one fund to the next managed by the same fund manager. Mm-hmm. But this was basically data on vintages from the 90s and the early 2000s. Right. Now, that persistence was never particularly strong. You were a little bit more likely to end up in the first tercile or quartile of performance when you back a past top quartile player, but it was there and it was statistically significant. Mm-hmm. As people have repeated that research uh, with more recent data, the general conclusion is that persistence has broken down. Persistence in IRR has broken down. It's no longer visible for the vintages in the 2000s. And there are several studies, both at the fund level and at the deal level, that show that finding. My, my own work replicates exactly that, and I look at very precise deal level data to, to assess persistence over a long period of time. And what I show is that indeed performance persistence in IRR is no longer there for the 2000s. Mm-hmm. However, if you move to a smarter performance measure that looks at the ability of GPs to outperform the public market and not only to generate absolute annual returns or IRR, then you see performance persistence again. So the value add, the alpha of two consecutive funds by the same GP persists whereas the absolute returns don't persist. And I've done some work to dig deeper into this to understand why this may be the case. And I think we can intuitively understand this for the 2000s because the 2000s were characterized by relatively extreme movements in the public market around you. Mm-hmm. Now take a skilled fund manager who always adds 500 basis points to the public market. On some ways, they, their IRR is great. On some periods of the market, the IRR is not so great because the market is down and you have been still some performance because you're better than the market, but it's, it's, a, it's very volatile. Basically, the market movements have distorted the performance categorization in IRR because some managers given the top quartile, they were not very skilled, they just got lucky in one fund, and the next fund around, they're not lucky anymore. And this randomness on whether the, the tide lifts all boats or whether you have strong headwinds, Mm-hmm. distorts then the quartile categorization of a fund sequence based on IRR. Switching to alpha, for example, the, 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 the Sparex alpha that I that developed in my, in my applied work as a performance measure allows you to still see performance persistence because you're directly measuring a value add and you're protecting the performance assessment from this the, the kind of random swings of the market environment around you. So if you look for the next winner, you can look in the rearview mirror but you have to look at a performance measure that captures outperformance and not only absolute performance of the different private equity funds. Mm-hmm. 
Okay, so you should instead of looking at IRR and TVPI, you think you should look at some sort of public market equivalent or things of that nature? Or? Yes, I, 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 you know, there are different ways to get into the measurement of pro, uh, public market equivalents. Um, yeah. Some of them at some point rely again on the IRR formula, and then they're kind of subject to the same biases that we described before, mm-hmm. that IRR can be distorted based on what's early in the life of the fund. My, my alpha measure is, a, is an annualized measure of, of outperformance of the public market that does not rely on IRR and is therefore more robust. With this measure, I see performance persistence, but it may well be that you see it also with, with, with other equally smart measures. Okay. Very interesting. Now, you've written about the investment returns, and I'm quoting uh, the topic of the paper here, Giants at the Gate, Investment Returns and Diseconomies of Scale in Private Equity. And one of the questions you've asked was whether or not bigger funds versus smaller funds, if there is a difference in in, in the performance. Can you elaborate on that that paper? Because I think that's a very important result that you've had. Yes, certainly. So, certainly. So, so the question of whether with a big outperform, small or vice versa, is, a, is a one in private equity that's been looked at for, for quite some time. It's difficult to just, you know, compare large funds versus small funds because, you know, then you get into all kinds of issues such as the survivorship bias. If you have a large fund today, you're probably older and successful because you were successful with smaller, smaller funds in the past. In this particular paper, we leveraged information on the private equity firms, not only with respect to their fund size, but with respect to the underlying deals they've done. So we can actually measure how many deals and how much capital they put to work at any given year. And importantly, also how many kind of lines or underlying investments they have in parallel at a, a certain point in time. Mm-hmm. And we, we used a couple of the different analyses to document to what extent an increase in scale is problematic for private equity returns. And we've seen this, and we could measure this on several levels. So, yes, you're expanding your scope of activity. Overall, it it hurts the performance of the private equity fund managers. Mm -hmm. And it's particularly the case if you increase the number of investments you manage in parallel. It's what we call the busyness of the fund manager in the paper. And it is intuitive that, of course, you know, with a similar-sized senior team, whether you have to oversee six investments or 16 investments at a given point in time influences your ability to add value to each of those underlying investments. So mm-hmm. I think it makes intuitive sense as we find that performance decreases if you expand the number of concurrent deals too rapidly as a private equity fund manager. Okay. So so as an LP, you you shouldn't necessarily look at the size, the overall size of the fund, the current fund that you're maybe potentially investing in, but the number of investments that the manager is is doing concurrently, correct? Yes, and, and more specifically, the increase in the number of concurrent investments. Okay. There were some funds who, there, there, there's some GPs who had like half a dozen to a dozen deals in their portfolio for every fund. They're stable like this. The other groups who systematically always made 30, 40 investments in parallel and have been stable as this. By and large, we see that this is fine. There's not necessarily a difference between those two because they're used to it and they and they're probably have the required resources. If you go from 15 to 30, however, from you know one fund to the next, that increase in the number of parallel investments, that's usually a warning signal that, you know, on the statistical average, uh, should be expected to go with lower returns. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. And it's an interesting topic to talk about at this current market environment as we see... GPs increasing their fund sizes by really high amounts. You know, it's very rare for you to see the next fund iteration of a manager be less than 50% higher than the current iteration. So, I guess this is a is an even more relevant topic today than it was in the past. Yes, yes. But then the question is, oh, does this increase in fund size translate into a a higher investment pace? than they had before. It may well be that they invested the last fund over three years. So if they now aim for a five-year investment horizon, they can easily digest a 30%, 40% larger overall amount of capital. And the next question is then, if, if they really deploy more capital in a year, does this translate into, into a higher number of underlying investments? Because it, it may well be that in the past, they've done larger deals uh, in club deals, and they had, they had a couple of junior partners in there. They do a little bit less of this now. Um, but they don't necessarily make more investments to deploy that capital. So, again, the the, the, um, 
just the, the fund size overall is an imperfect indicator of, of what may be going on there. Yeah, you, you also mentioned that, you know, there might be some other reasons why an LP would invest in funds that are increasing the number of concurrent investments, regardless of, you know, even though they know the result of their study. And, and one, of, one of the reasons you mentioned is co-investment opportunities. A very hot topic right now. What is your view on co-investments and the maybe the balance of incentives or the change in balance of incentives uh, that it provides to GPs and LPs? Yeah, there again, I think the, the, the starting point for this is, is a rational one. I think the first observation is that in the 2000s, lots of deals where GPs needed more capital than they can put up themselves were done as club deals, so they were basically teaming up with their comp- competitors to make a deal. Today, they switch from this to rather co-investing with their LPs, with their partners or with their competitors. I think that's a healthy starting point overall. The key objective for the limited partner to co-invest, to say, well, I'm going to avoid some fees here, I think that's also a, a legitimate objective that they have. So I think these reasons explain co-invest and they, they justify them. I would say there are better fee mechanisms than co-invest to lower the fees, but that's a, that's a different part of the conversation. What's problematic, I think, is the is the question whether LPs really have the ability to meaningfully execute on co-invest. Can they really diligence with the GP? Can they act fast enough? Can they be good partners uh, in the ownership of those, of those underlying assets? And then beyond this, do they understand the impact of increased concentration of capital risk in individual transactions? Mm-hmm. Now, difficult to observe data on this in generality, and the studies empirically I've seen on this have results that are not necessarily in line with what I observe anecdotally in the market. But for all we know, within the portfolio of a given GP, the larger investments are, on average, the lower performing investments. Now, if I just apply common sense, the larger deals are probably the ones more likely to be offered for co-investment because that's where they need additional firepower. That's possibly a a bad starting point for the... uh, for the, the co-invest program. So it all comes down to the ability of the limited partners to carefully select those opportunities from the co-invest which are really which are really attractive. Are they really able to cherry pick? And there, again, I just have to assume that some might be better at this than others. Some have been co-investing for decades. They say very successfully so if they compare the performance of what they've been picked versus the average performance of those managers. I have to assume that this is not the case for everybody. And if you're blindly rushing into co-invest and you're doing the type of co-invest that others don't want, you yeah. probably will suffer a performance drag that's much more important than whatever percentage you may have saved on the on the fee side. Yeah, that's, that's a very interesting point. The other topic that, that I, I had a pleasure to read, one of your papers, titled Corporate Governments and Value Creation, and you set out to answer three very interesting questions. and. Uh, one of them is uh, whether or not performance of, of private equity managers are based on, on, on leverage or, or luck or market timing or whether or not those returns represent the value created on the, on the operational side. Can you mm-hmm. elaborate on that and how you actually measured that effect? Yeah, so the, the, the way in general to, to quantify these different effects is to say, well, there was a certain amount of value created on the, on the transaction. That value created is typically related to some appreciation of the equity value. And then just applying simple accounting math, you know, you get to more equity value either by growing EBITDA or by increasing the trading multiple, so selling the company for a higher multiple of EBITDA or by paying down debt. And we had a sample of a couple of partner transactions on which we were able to gather the required accounting data on the underlying companies, both at the moment of the acquisition mm-hmm. and then after the exit. So we can basically break down and, and, and quantify for each investment what percentage of the overall gain was attributed, attributable to each of those three factors. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the, there's, there's one big caveat, however, which I don't think the practitioners have substantially, it's not sufficiently uh, endorsed with respect to this analysis because there is a there is a bias in general among limited partners to say, well, I like performance if it's coming from the fundamentals, from the EBITDA growth. Right. I don't like performance so much when it's coming from multiple expansion, and I certainly don't like too much just from the from the deleverage. 
I would I would argue that this is a bit simplistic as a view. Uh, second example, you know, I'm I'm buying today a phenomenal company. It's underperforming today. I had a great idea to transform it to make it a really uh, phenomenal company. And I take five years for all these phenomenal things to show up in the accounting value. After this, if you if you imagine this this company, I I, I make an investment in a, in a company. I have a great value creation thesis. I take all these initiatives as a private equity investor, and after five years, I've doubled EBITDA. I then sell the company for twice my money. The math says 100% of my returns come from EBITDA growth. Limited partners will like that. Imagine the exact same deal. But a year and a half into the investment, a strategic buyer shows up. He sees the company. He understands what I just triggered, all the changes I just initiated, and he takes this off of my hand. None of these changes are visible yet in EBITDA. I'm still in transformation mode. But the strategic acquirer shows up and says, well, I'm going to take this off your hands for twice the money you pay for it. I will have generated the same returns. But in this example, all the returns will have come from market expansion. Mm -hmm. So you have two stories, and in both stories, I have the same skill at finding the right target company and identifying the right value levers. But in one scenario, 100% of the, those value levers show up in the fundamentals. In the other case, all of this shows up in the hmm. And with this, with this observation, I think you have to recognize that you've got to look at the context of the deal, and particularly at the duration and the longevity of the deal, to understand what you make out of that multiple effect. If you really expand the multiple in a short period of time, it may as well be that the next acquirer of the business has seen the good things you're doing. Versus if, if the deal is running for five years and you would, would have had time to change the fundamentals, but you didn't, and then it's only on the multiple upside, that's a very different story. Yeah, that makes sense. And uh, you're absolutely right that I guess that there is a, a sort of a, of a bias against uh, return attributed to, to deleveraging or increases in multiple. But, I mean, we've seen, I guess, you know, in the 80s and 90s, we saw... PE return attributed more f from deleveraging and, 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 and multiple expansion than the, 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 the sort of operational improvements that private equity investors love to see. And the returns in the past, I guess, were different than the ones that we expect in private equity today as well. So how do you, how do you think that the decreasing reliance on, on leverage and multiple expansion that we're seeing today will change the expected returns for private equity going forward? That's a very, very difficult topic because there's so many macroeconomic factors that get into the, the overall expected returns. What you describe, of course, I mean, the long-term view is that, yes, there's been a shift. On average performance, at least of the data that we've seen, seem to have come down a little bit. On the average, I mean, the, the, the anecdotes say that there was more financial arbitrage and more leverage in the in the 90s than we get today, which all makes sense because today we have a much more competitive market, so the low-end foods are gone. The uh, the acquisition prices compete away a good amount of the value creation, so private equity firms just have to earn, work, work harder to, to generate the same returns. Now, it's very, very difficult to say going forward how returns will evolve because nobody can predict the macro really. But if people criticize the current situation as all well, performance has come down in private equity, I always like to point them to one of the performance statistics that, that, that we issue that track the last couple of vintages, not in terms of absolute annual returns or IRR, but with respect to that alpha measure that I identified before, that I mentioned before. Mm -hmm. And the, the vintages 2009 to 2012 in alpha terms have actually have an increasing performance tendency. So the ability to, to, of private equity to add it to the, the stock market would have generated to outperform the stock market seems to be increasing again. Now overall, the, you know, the whole, uh, the whole macro yield is coming down. So the, there's less and less absolute returns to be generated, but private equity seems to have done a good job to adjust to whatever changes we had in the world uh, post uh, great financial crisis and to continue to be able to add the value in a meaningful way over the public market returns. Now, again, I'm, I'm not in the business of predicting the future, certainly not when it comes to investing, but I think this is overall encouraging if you look at the asset class to see, yeah, yields may be coming down overall, but if it stays an asset class that's able to outperform, that may be a reason for investors to look at it.
Let's let's talk about management teams, and 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 this is one. I guess the third it was the third question that you answered in in this paper that I just mentioned, and you looked at the backgrounds of the、uh, general partners and how that has played a role in the the returns or the value created by by those managers. So if you, if I'm looking at a, a fund manager today. Or let's 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 let me rephrase this. If you're looking at a fund manager today and you try to analyze the ability of the management team to to repeat the positive performance that they had in the past, what are some of the things that you look at? Well, it's a, it's a it's a interesting topic, and of course one that that many limited partners look at more based on just 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 common sense and gut feeling. In the in the paper about、uh, corporate governance and value creation you mentioned earlier, we had the ability to look actually at the human resource profiles of a large number of managers, and we classified them broadly in kind of the kind of the finance types. So those with a background, for example, with the accounting in banking or with the accounting firms, on the one hand side, and on the kind of strategic background partners, those who had a prior history either as a line manager or with one of the strategy consultants, for instance. We're very curious to see if there's any difference between the two, and a bit and a bit disappointed to see that there's no performance difference on the average deals that those two groups have been doing. But then we we looked at our sample and we found that of course there are different deal types in there, and in particular there's some of the deal types which have more an M&A theme to them, those, those so-called buy and build or build-ups where you acquire a target company, a platform, and then you make bold on investments, often in the same industry, to them. And this has become the major thesis of your value creation. Versus other investments, we just buy a target company and we go for organic growth.、Mm-hmm. If we if we cross those two variables, in other words, if we check whether you know the finance types or the strategy types perform better on the organic deals, and then ask the same question for the deals with the buy and build component, we see a very interesting result, which I think makes intuitive sense. The finance types are better performing in those M&A type transactions and the buy and build transactions, versus the strategy types are relatively better performing if they're if they're overseas deals who have an organic value creation fee. So that tells us that yeah, the、um, the background of the investment manager on the average does play a role. None of these findings is automatic, like there's always the proverbial exception to the statistical rule. Um,、mm-hmm. but these these findings、uh, do do show up and show you that the HR profiles are. Important, but they need to be analyzed in conjunction with the type of deal the private equity firm is doing. Now, a more recent、uh, research of mine basically linked the question of the impact of the individual investment manager with the topic of performance persistence that we talked about beforehand, and that's an interesting one because uh, that's uh, that's a study、uh, together with Golden Capital in, in, in Munich under the working title of、uh, you know man versus machine. We wanted to understand whether performance persistence is an attribute of the fund manager, so the franchise, you know, the the company of Bain Capital or the company of KKR,、mm-hmm. versus an attribute of the individual investment manager. So this has been a Dwight Polar deal, or this has been a Johannes Hoot deal. Is the past performance of these individuals indicative of the performance of their next deal, versus the past performance of the entire GP being indicative of the performance of the next deal? We, we ran those numbers on, on on hundreds of transactions and thousands of, of individual managers, based on information of who's done which deal, and the finding there says well both are important as you would expect, but the individual wins. So statistically speaking, a lion's share of performance persistence is explained by the individual. The ratio is roughly two thirds to one third. So whether the, the individual investment manager has done well in the past is more indicative of your performance going forward. Than the average return of the whole GP, which is something that if I was a you know a mid-level person at an established private equity firm, I would prominently point out that finding to the senior founder of the firm when it comes to cal- career allocation of the next fund. And as an LP, of course, I would、uh, I would look at this very carefully if I judge the likely performance of spin-offs. Uh, so of course, a, a big if that we that we cannot measure correctly, we can only suspect it. But it seems to be that that groups can, to some extent, claim that their portable track record, so the deals they've done in the past with another GP,、mm-hmm. should be, in, to some extent, indicative of their performance on their own going forward. Precisely because the finding is that the, the persistency is not only or even predominantly an aspect of the of the private equity firm, but the, but the human element is very important in this equation.
Absolutely. That's that's actually a very interesting finding. You know, with, without pointing fingers here, I know for a fact that there were some transactions which were first attributed to a, a senior partner of the firm that stayed with the firm, and after the investment had clearly tanked and turned sour, all of a sudden it was attributed to a more junior person who since then left that firm. So yeah. um, uh, this this may be perfectly legitimate, but the, the skeptical outsider may, may just think that there may be other reasons that influence that, that attribution. Having said all this, however, given that there's always noise uh, related to the information who's done the deal, we have to be very careful in the study that you mentioned uh, with the with corporate governance and, and value creation, also the more recent finding man versus machine, we have to be very careful to understand what bias is introduced. But um, if if there's noise around who's really responsible for that for a given deal, if this attribution is imperfect, it's a bias that would suggest there shouldn't be a finding. Right? Mm -hmm. If we find something even with a noisy information about who's done the deal, then we can be pretty sure that well, in actuality, who's really done the deal will absolutely have made a difference. So it's it's, it's something that we had on our on, on our list of things to check, and we, we believe even more in our findings because you know that that bias is out there. We cannot control for it, but we we just know that it goes against what we were trying to look for. Oliver, very very interesting stuff. Now let me let me switch gears a little bit. And since this is a finance podcast that focuses on people that are, you know, uh, looking to strive in in, in 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 finance in general, and since the topic of the day is private equity, I know that you've looked at hundreds of LPs and GPs throughout your career. So my question would be, in your opinion, what is it that makes a potentially good GP? And and the second would be, what is it that makes a potentially good LP. What makes a good GP and a good LP? Of course, very, very difficult to, to, to answer this in general. Let me start with a GP and let me specifically take the perspective of somebody relatively early in their career in finance to, to look at this as a, as a career opportunity. First of all, I mean, uh, while consultants and accountants kind of hire folks by the busload sometimes, the number of jobs in private equity are relatively scarce. So when I, whenever I discuss this with, with, my, with my MBA or, or master's level students, I get to tell them that a direct entry into private equity is not likely a scenario for many of them. It may be more likely to slowly get into the asset class by, by getting into related jobs, leverage finance, strategy consultant, M&A finance, and then get exposure to those firms, build up your network, and then get into them. Mm -hmm. In general, like in, in many other organizations, you have the choice between, you know, on a relatively early stage in your career, signing up with a smaller shop and then having earlier a, a more birds perspective on deals, have responsibility for the entire transaction, sit on the boards of the, of the portfolio company and so forth, mm -hmm. in a small firm on smaller companies versus getting in with one of the very large firms where the initial job description may be almost that of the stereotypical investment banker who sees lots of Excel spreadsheets but has very little contact with the enemy, if you want, and has, has only very partial exposure to the deals, to the deals management and to portfolio companies themselves. That's a choice that people should have on their radar based on, on where you want to get in, how patient you are, They'll be fascinated by seeing everything on something small or something very small on, 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 on a big transaction. Now, with respect to the firm itself, whether it's a good cheap or not for you to work in, there are lots of factors to look at, and I'm probably missing some because I've never made a career myself in, in, in the private equity world. I would, of course, carefully analyze the track record of the firm themselves to see how, how good they are. I would try to uh, assess to what extent incentives are set in this firm. Is this still the firm controlled and, and largely owned by the founding partners? Or have economics been shared more broadly? Have the key of economics been passed to the next generation, which are currently the, the, the deal makers? All of these things are important beyond general climate in the firm because they tell you, you know, how likely it is that the key rate makers may disappear and what's the general philosophy of the firm with respect to sharing meaningful parts of economics with the next generations. Mm -hmm. Beyond these specific HR aspects, I believe there are a variety of factors that, that need to be considered, which, you know, tell you whether the GP is a good employer just as much as they tell the LP whether this is a good investment opportunity. You want to understand the strategy for growth of that, of that general partner. How sustainable is it? How sustainable is the track record? Are they growing themselves to death? Are they, are they branching out of the niche where they make great investments and into uncharted territory? All of this, you're going to look at very carefully, 
you want a firm that grows and expands because that means they need to hire you, but you don't want to sign up with a firm that grows themselves to death and then in the next fundraising cycle, they're going to have a very hard time to raise the next amount, uh, batch of capital because mm-hmm. their performance is suffering. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's very, very good advice. Now, on the LP side, if you are, if you are responsible for private equity portfolio of a, of a pension fund, what is it that you think makes a, a good a limited partner? Well, I think the limited partner was at least as, uh, as diverse uh, and as sort of a broad range of different LP types as you have it in the general partner world, probably even more so because there's some people investing in private equity where this is really only very adjacent uh, element to their portfolio, citing an, an anecdote which I don't honestly may not have any kind of connection with the truth, but the, the story is about, you know, why some U.S. pension schemes continue through the 2000s to be invested in private equity despite a, a very disappointing performance track record they had at the time. And somebody told me jokingly, Oliver, you know, we're a, we're a, we're a plan, we're very egalitarian, we like our colleagues. If somebody is a little less gifted than the others and we, we put them on, on fixed income or, or liquid equities, they benchmark every quarter, and if we see, people see that they're not doing such a good job, then they, uh, uh, they're, they're, they have got to be kicked out. Um, we stick them in private equity because it takes a decade for anybody to understand the performance impact of the decisions, and by that time, the world has changed so often around you, you get a good job, they can't do much harm there. Now, I, I don't suspect for a second that any of this really happens, but that, uh, that, that little anecdote just goes with me to characterize maybe some plans for you know, private equity is a relatively peripheral part of their activities. They don't fully understand that they do a little bit of it. They're not very sophisticated at it. You may have a comfortable, peaceful life in those plans, but you will probably not make a great career, probably not make much money. That, that may not be what, what most people are looking for. On the other extreme, of course, there are some LPs who are extremely professional, certainly as professional as the general partners in terms of their approach to private equity, great training, very sophisticated, deep teams, deep skills, often with the opportunity to do, you know, co-invest and potentially direct deals, so basically be in the driver's seat just like the GPs. Uh, you know, those, those two extremes, I think, characterize the range of opportunities in LP land. There's no general recommendation I could I could uh, make. It very much depends on your preference and your risk profile. If you want to sign up with, a, with an LP like a fund of funds who's, you know, performance dependent themselves, who has to always hunt for their own capital, where you basically – implicitly carrying a dual hat between making investments and marketing those investment track records to attract uh, third-party money, or whether you rather work for the ultimate asset owners, be it a, be it a small family office or, or a pension scheme, where you are responsible for, for managing their capital, not have any requirement to attract third-party money. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Now, if there's a student listening to this right now and he's more interested in trying to understand the, you know, the the true data side of things, you know, what you mentioned at the very beginning, instead of just relying on anecdotal information, they really want to understand where performance comes from, you know, where where returns come from. Do you have any body of knowledge or any any textbooks or books that you recommend them to read so that they can get up to speed? There's no such thing as the one Bible on private equity per se. I think two Two books came uh, to mind. I mean, one is a publication by my friend and colleague, Josh Lerner at Harvard. Uh, he's written some, some kind of private equity case books, uh, looking at a series of Harvard case studies on different actors in private equity, which is very informative. There's also a book on international private equity by my, my uh, colleague and co-author, Eddie Talmore at the London Business School, at the London Business School's Private Equity Institute. My, my own recent publication on private equity mathematics is a, it's probably a bit more technical and, and more for the you know, investment professionals who, who kind of do these things day in, day out and, and perform the, the more advanced calculations themselves. But I probably would, would start with the, with the Josh Lerner and the Ali Talmore textbooks to get some general uh, overview of the asset class. Well, Oliver, thank you very much for your time. We just hit the one hour mark. Uh, very good. <laughs> We we're, we're trying to be punctual as you know as 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 you're a German and I live in Germany so uh, I want to thank you for your time I I guess I could go on to talk about you know some of the research that you've done in private equity for a long time but we really appreciate your time and uh, if there are any any follow up questions from some of our listeners we just forward them to you maybe we can keep the dialogue going but uh, for, for for the time being thank you very much for taking the time. My pleasure. All the best, and always looking forward to comments and feedback on what we discussed. Perfect.
Thank you for listening to the Wall Street Lab podcast. For the show notes and much more, visit us at www.thewallstreetlab.com. To see what we're up to before anyone else, subscribe to our newsletter on our website and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Disclaimer. Information contained in this podcast constitutes the opinions of individuals and should not be treated as investment, tax, financial or legal advice. We take no responsibility for the accuracy of any statements made in this podcast. This podcast is for informational and educational purposes only, and it does not contain an offer to sell or buy any sort of financial products and should not be treated as advertisement for such. Any copying, distribution or reproduction of this podcast without the prior permission of the creators of the podcast is strictly prohibited.